Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining uh, myself and Bobby Hyde from the University of Nottingham today to talk about the latest findings from Bobby's PhD um, on calf housing and management. Um, Bobby actually did his PhD uh, funded by um, AHDB Day. So just a few bits of housekeeping uh, before we kick off. Um, you are all going to stay muted um, at home. Um, so the best way that you're going to be able to interact with us is by typing in questions into the question box, which you will see in the control panel on the right hand side of your screen and um, all questions will be anonymous um, but if you do want to let us know who you are then enter your name um, and um, we um, can say hello and give you a shout out um, and just uh, to let you know that today's webinar is forming part of uh, GB uh, CAF week which kicked off yesterday at Agri Scott um, up in uh, Edinburgh. Uh, we have a whole series of events uh, planned for the next week between now and next Wednesday and um, you can participate in the conversations on social media by using hashtag GB CAF week or by tweeting some of uh, uh, Bobby's um, best um, uh, top tips um, um, from his webinar today. Uh, there will be some social media activity over the uh, weekend as well, which will focus around um, sharing the skills um, that you think are needed to rear rear calves um, and also giving a shout out and a thank you to your calf rearer or to someone else in the supply chain. So do get involved in that um, do get involved in in that conversation over the weekend. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over uh, to Bobby to uh, tell us um, what he found uh, during his PhD studies. So over to you, Bobby. Thanks very much, Jenny. Um, good afternoon, everyone. A nice rainy afternoon. I'm sure we're all quite grateful. We're hopefully inside listening to a webinar rather than out in, in the calf pen. Um, calves on UK dairy farms are under an enormous amount of pressure. Um, so the disease pressure they're under, uh, for pre wean calves anyway, at a national level, about one in five calves don't get enough colostrum um, and don't get enough immunity into their blood. About half of calves get diarrhea. About half of calves get some sort of respiratory disease, so pneumonia, or having a cough. Um, and about one in 20 actually die within that pre-weaning period, which I'm sure we can all agree is, is quite a high rate. And I, and I think we can we can do better. Um, and I think there's hopefully lots of things that we found um, during the course of the PhD um, that, that can help people to improve the health and welfare of their calves. We, we also know there's there's a tremendous amount of um, pressure on, on dairy farmers um, and young stock can often just fall slightly down there down the list there's a lot of other jobs to be doing it's a hard job a laborious job um, uh, and young stock can can sometimes just sometimes come second uh, compared with the with the adult milking cow but it's important we really raise the level of our young stock up you know the future replacements of our herd um, you know really really important we get that right so what what's important in terms of calf health and getting the best out of your calves in terms of their performance but also having the highest health and welfare um, well, going into the, the PhD, I, I certainly had a, a range of things I thought were important, and I, I'm sure all of you have things that you think are the most important things for rearing calves. But but in truth, we we don't really know. So you know, we might say, okay, well, we've got to keep them really warm and keep them sheltered, um, or or perhaps people will tell you it's about the drainage and keeping them really dry, um, or perhaps it's about the type of inlet ventilation you have, or the outlet ventilation, or maybe it's to do with the height of the building, or Maybe it's even that we've got to have them in hutches and we've got to bed them really, really high. Or is it about having some sort of fan ventilation in place? Is it feeding them colostrum in powdered form? Is it giving them antibiotics all the time? Or is it actually just making sure they've got they've got clean water to drink? So there's a whole host of things that could influence calf health and probably do influence calf health in some way. But for a, a time poor, very busy dairy farmer, what are the key most important things that you can do on your farm? to get the best out of your calves um, it is really the question we were asking as part of my PhD. 
So the way we hope to answer that question was through machine learning. And you get talked about um, machine learning and AI in the news quite a lot. But what really is that? Well, it's a series of, of algorithms, um, computer algorithms that take in a whole range of information and make decisions that we as humans would find very, very hard to, to process that amount of information. So what affects calf performance? Well, you know, it could be the stocking density, could be something to do with the calving pattern the herd size, the colostrum volume, the colostrum quantity, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of things as we know that might be important with calf health and performance, but we're not quite sure which ones. And with machine learning, we can put all of those different parameters from loads and loads of different farms and get the, the machine to predict whether things are likely to increase the chance of disease or decrease the chance of disease. Are any of these factors going to increase the chance of death? And are any of these factors going to increase your production and your growth rates? So the first part of the study was to assess calf mortality. Um, and we did this uh, at a national level to try and identify what were the, the key things at a national level that, uh, that reduced calf mortality, that, that stopped calves dying unnecessarily, which we thought was quite important. So we took BCMS data and we took over 20 million recorded deaths. So every single recorded death of a, 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 a cow or, or a calf in the whole country across almost 10 years. We knew where those animals died. So what, did they die at a slaughterhouse or did they die on farm? There's about 3 million deaths on farm. And what age group did they die? And actually around 25% of all the animals that died on farm um, died within the first three months of life. So quite a high rate of death in that very short um, first time period. From our analysis, we then looked at what factors were associated with those increased deaths. So was it the breed of the animal? Was it the sex of the animal? Was it the month of birth? And was it the environmental temperature? So that's of the country as a whole. We took Met Office data to say what temperature was it um, during that month and did that temperature influence calf mortality? One of the first figures to look at is just how things changed over time um, and things don't really seem to have budged that much. There's some pretty obvious differences, though, in terms of who's at a higher mortality rate. So certainly the dairy breeds seem to be at a higher mortality rate, um, generally speaking, than the non-dairy breeds, so beef breeds. And also the male animals seem to be uh, at a higher mortality rate than the female animals. We start to break this down in a bit more detail um, and some really interesting patterns uh, arise. So you can see the beef animals at the top there um, and they're at a much lower mortality rate than the, the dairy animals, which are, is the panels at the, at the bottom. So you can see on the left hand side, the, the dairy animals are kind of between five and nine percent mortality uh, in the worst months. Um, and the beef animals are, are only up to four or five percent, comparatively much lower than the dairy animals. Again, you can see the differences in male versus female, but there's some really interesting patterns then in the month at which they were born. So you can see that all of the dots here are, are a different year within this data set. And you can see all of the October, so October 2011, October 2012, October 2013, all of those Octobers, there were much higher mortality rates than, than calves born in the summer. So something about being born in the winter months means you're you're more likely to die as a calf. And it's quite a big difference kind of moving from two and a half percent for beef up to maybe five percent if you were unlucky and you were born in December. So there's also an effect here of temperature. And within each box, you can see the the lines there, they, they show the trends at which um, mortality decreases as temperature increases. So if you take the top right panel, for example, in December, um, if the December was a warmer December, less calves died than if it was a colder December. Um, and that's true for both beef in the top right panel and dairy in the bottom right panel. Um, and, and there seems to be uh, this this effect seems to be independent of, of the month. So there's something about the month of December. And there's also something that is a separate issue that's about the temperature of that month as well. And we can tease that out with our statistical models and our machine learning. So we're quite often told that calves don't, don't mind being cold and it's OK if calves are cold. Uh, and I, I'm not sure this graph really reflects that, actually, when you look at the data. Uh, and it certainly looks like the warmer months over winter 
um, certainly re results in, in less calves dying. What was quite interesting and, and perhaps a, a little bit of an aside for this webinar, but, but, I, but I thought was quite interesting. So when you then start looking at human mortality figures, and I, I was able to find human mortality for exactly the same time period. So the mortality rate is lower in humans than it is in calves. But you see a very similar pattern, actually. So more male mortality than female mortality. Um, and also in winter months, particularly in, in January, those warmer months tended to be associated with lower rates of mortality as well. So ev even in humans, there seems to be some sort of trend of increased temperature, which is a little bit um, a little bit difficult to tease out exactly why that is. Because of course, you'd assume in, in most Western countries, certainly in the winter, people still are inside largely with heating and so on. There still seems to be this effect of, of uh, colder temperature seems to be worse for mortality, um, even for people. So part of our um, approach with the PhD was, was to do some quite advanced machine learning techniques, but we, we really wanted these to be available for people in practical, easy to use tools. So we created this herd health toolkit. And within this toolkit, there's a, a whole range of different tools um, and it's freely available. Um, and we, we've taken actually the machine learning models we created from that 20 million cow database um, and, and condensed it down into this really easy to use tool to show the effects of mortality. So you can go to this website, um, nottingham.ac.uk forward slash herd health toolkit, and you can have a play with some of the parameters in that model. So for example, you can look at changing the month of birth. You can look at, okay, what if it was a male animal and what if it was a dairy animal? And you can see on the top right, the mortality rate predicted is, is changing depending on those parameters based on national figures. And sliding that temperature up and down can give you a really interesting idea what if I could get my calves five degrees warmer? What's that going to do to their risk of, of dying in that period? And actually, even just a few degrees change can make quite a substantial difference to the mortality rate of those animals. So we kind of had a pretty good baseline of what the mortality rates in the UK were like, or in Great Britain, I should say, were like. Um, and we had some idea of what might be causing those. But of course, with a big national database, you can't really drill in to an individual farm and say, right, what was this farm doing? So we then decided to create a calf health plan um, based on the latest evidence, but based on also real figures from real farms. So we recruited 60 dairy farms um, across the whole country to try and get a real spread of good farms, bad farms, everything in between, um, uh, and, a, and a range of geographical locations. From each of those farms, I, I went and visited and, and conducted quite a detailed questionnaire. So we knew everything there was to know about that farm in terms of how they rear their calves. So we knew when those calves were born. Um, we knew uh, what kind of colostrum those calves were getting, what kind of housing they might go into. And we measured those, all, all of the housing the calves went into with laser measurers. So we knew all the dimensions of those housings as well what milk feeding they got and any subsequent buildings they then went on to. We also put data loggers into the housing as well. So we knew um, up to the minute exactly what the, the temperature of those buildings was. Um, farmers then recorded the weights of animals at, at birth and also at weaning, recorded disease and recorded mortality. We also took colostrum bacteriology samples from the colostrum and some um, total proteins from the calves uh, calf's blood so to, to identify whether animals had enough immunity or not. So from that study we had 60 calves, we measured over a thousand different things about that each farm from the machine learning models. What was the most important things in, in identifying whether calves were going to grow well or not? So a few things came up in terms of colostrum and this was quite reassuring to me, it's something you know I'd certainly as a vet be pushing quite a lot and there's quite a lot of evidence on it and the machine learning picked out colostrum as being one of the most important factors in terms of good calf performance and when I say key factors um, I mean specifically feeding three or four litres of colostrum doing so within six hours and we also identified that actually the hygiene of the colostrum could be quite important in terms of calf performance so keeping the bacteria levels in that in that colostrum as low as we can Nutrition um, seems to be very important. I think that's what most of us as vets and as farmers would agree. It's very, very important for calf performance. And by nutrition key points, what I mean specifically here is actually feeding between six and eight litres per day. And there's lots of farms still feeding four or five litres. 
um, and you're really not going to get the best performance from your calves if you're feeding a low level like that. Um, there was also some quite interesting findings with regards to whole milk versus milk replacer powder. And some of the farms feeding whole milk actually did a little bit better in terms of preventing scout. And there's a whole host of differences between milk powder and, and liquid milk, um, I think would be really interesting for some, some future research. The hygiene of the pens was really important. That's both the calf pens. So clean. we found that cleaning your calf pens at least every 30 days and cleaning the calving pens um, every 21 days was really important in terms of calf performance. So that kind of gives you some exact figures. It's quite hard to know when it's just yourself on your own farm, you get in the habit of, right, it's every six weeks or every eight weeks or whatever it is. But actually the farms that were doing it every 30 days at least for a full clean out um, for the calf pens and 21 days for calving pens did the best um, in terms of calf performance. The housing again was interesting and we found an effect of temperature as, as we did for the, the national study as well. So we kind of reinforced that, that finding. We found that calves are able to nest into the straw. So bedding them so that you can't see their legs when they're lying down allows them to nest into that straw. And actually they conserve a bit of heat um, and, and can grow a bit better from that. And we also explored a bit of supplementary heat. And, and by supplementary heat, I, I mean putting in big patio heaters to keep those calves um, as warm as as warm as they can be. So we came up with that plan based on the findings from the first phase of the study, but we weren't quite content with that. Um, we really wanted to test it and see that it worked in real life conditions. So to do that, we took uh, the same population, 60 farms, and then we randomly allocated each one of those farms to one of two groups. So one group, was to receive the calf health plan, everything that we found in a, in a nice and easy to follow format. And the other half of the farms would be given no advice at all. So they would just keep monitoring their calf outcomes, but they wouldn't be given any advice as to what they should do to improve. And we monitored that over a whole winter period um, for about three, three to six months um, to see what, what the effect was of the plan. Did it, did it actually have an effect? And these are some of the results. So each of the dots here is a farm. If it's orange, then they have, they were, they had the intervention, so they were given the calf health plan. And if they're blue, they were the control group. So that means they had no advice whatsoever. From left to right, you can see the number of the intervention points they had in place. So if you're on the right hand side of any of those eight graphs, that means you put in pretty much all of the points on the plan into place. And if you're on the very left hand side, it means you're probably not doing almost any of the things that we think are important. And you can see for all of these different panels, so average daily gain at the top, how fast are those calves growing? There's a pretty obvious trend there, whether you're looking at dairy heifers on the left or, or beef calves on the right or male calves on the right. And it, the more things they were doing from that plan, the, in, the better their growth rates. And of course, uh, farms in the in the plan group tended to do more of those those plan points because we were encouraging them, you know, these are the things we think you should be doing. And people tended to take on three, four, five or six of those points and then their calves did better. Diarrhea as well, the more things you're doing from that plan, the lower your diarrhea rates, the lower your scour rates. Mortality rates were, were a reasonably similar trend, although maybe not quite as strong for the dairy heifer, certainly. And pneumonia rate was much flatter. And that was a, a real weakness of the study, I think. It was, it was very, very challenging to accurately monitor pneumonia rates. Um, you know, and I think that's quite well known in, in the research literature. It's very, very hard to accurately diagnose pneumonia. And of course, everyone diagnoses it slightly differently. So actually to, to, for farmers to say, yes, this animal has got pneumonia, there were some farms maybe that, that wouldn't. Uh, recognize even even a fairly substantial cough as pneumonia so it's much harder to tease that out from this study but certainly for the growth rates diarrhea rates and mortality rates seems to be a very positive effect of doing more things from that that calf health plan i mentioned uh, a few slides back the importance of low bacteria levels in your colostrum and this was an area we really wanted to explore in a bit more detail so for this part of the study we took um, a load of samples from colostrum to, to test really what is the effect of high bacteria levels on immunity. 
We've got to remember that calves are born with absolutely zero immunity. So they come out of, of their, their cow, they come out of the cow completely naive to everything. They're very, very susceptible to disease. So it's really important we get them good colostrum as soon as possible. So we can remember what we need to do in terms of colostrum feeding with the three cues of colostrum. So we have to feed it quickly within six hours. We need the right quantity, and that's going to be three to four litres, depending on the size of the cow, the calf. And we've got to have good quality. And usually by that, people mean that it's it's a good concentration of immunity within that colostrum. But we also now think that it's really important that actually quality encompasses the cleanliness of that, that colostrum as well. If we don't get those things right, the, the literature is quite clear and the research is quite clear. If you don't get good colostrum immunity, you're much more likely to get a scour, you're much more likely to get pneumonia, and you're much more likely to die. So this is really critical that we get this right. Our colostrum results, we tested for the quality in terms of how much immunity was in that colostrum, was it enough? And about one in three of the nearly 700 samples we tested failed in terms of the quality of that colostrum. We tested for hygiene to see whether there was high bacteria levels or not. And again, about one in three of the 270 samples that we tested for, for hygiene were classed as dirty. So very high levels of bacteria. We also tested calf bloods to see uh, what rates of passive transfer failure there were. And one or two calves in every, every, every 10 uh, actually failed in terms of getting enough immunity and were therefore much more likely to have disease later on. So we were pretty keen to explore what factors were associated with bacteria levels in colostrum. Um, and one thing we found was the temperature of the water that you clean your colostrum collection equipment. So lots of farms just use cold water to clean their colostrum collection equipment. <coughs> um, but some farms use scalding hot water. And you can see the effect on bacteria levels if you do use scalding hot water. It's much, much lower bacteria levels. What you use as well, if you just use water, um, you can see it's relatively high bacteria levels. If you just use parlor wash, it's still relatively high bacteria levels. But if you use hypochlorite or peracetic acid, much, much lower bacteria levels again. It's about 50% of farms were using scalding hot water. Only about 15% of farms were using hypochlorite peracetic acid and pasteurizing as well. Very, very effective in reducing bacteria levels, but not that many people were doing it. Only about 3% in this study. So temperature we found in a, in a few different studies seem to be really important. As I showed before, at a national level, temperature seems to be very important in mortality rates. And we also found that temperature was important when we did a, a more detailed study on individual farms. So to explore this uh, a bit more thoroughly, we designed a randomized control trial where we divided calves on a single farm into four groups. So we either gave them no heat source and no jacket. We gave them a one kilowatt heater, but no jacket. We didn't give them a heater, but we did give them a calf jacket or we gave them both a heater and a jacket. We then monitored those animals over a several week period to see how fast they grow. <coughs> Quite important here to uh, remind people that any kind of heater in a calf pen has a potential to cause a fire. So if you are going to put any kind of heat sources in your calf pens, please make sure they are really securely attached. This is not the kind of thing to lash on with beta twine. It's something to put on with steel cables uh, and make sure there's no way that that can end up in the in the straw. If it does end up in the straw, the, the consequences are, are quite severe, as you can imagine. These heaters were one kilowatt heaters. So they're quite big and they're quite powerful, about four times the power of kind of a small heat lamp that you might use for, for lambs. Um, so they are a bit more costly to run, but they do generate quite a lot more, more heat for the animals. So these are the results from that study. There's a few things to pick apart on this graph. So firstly, looking left and right, you can see all of the calves with without a jacket. And on the right hand side, you can see all the calves with a jacket. And there's probably not too much difference there. And that's been found in, in several other studies, actually, that jackets don't seem to improve growth rates. 
Um, so that's not to say they're, they're a waste of time. They may still be adding some sort of comfort effect to the calves, but they don't seem to be improving growth rates. The other thing to compare here is to look at the lamp group versus the no lamp group. So that's the orange versus the blue here. And you can see that regardless of whether the calves had jackets on, the calves under, under heat lamps, under these patio heaters, grew much faster than those that weren't under the heat lamps. And in this study, being under a heat lamp was worth nearly 0.1 of a kilo per day growth rate. So quite a substantial increase, 100 grams a day more growth rates for every calf that's under a, under a heat lamp. So we, we were also able to pick in that study um, for each of the individual calves on the study, we knew the average temperature that they were under. Some of them were under heat lamps, some of them weren't, but we monitored those pens um, to see exactly what temperature they were under for that time period. And you can see again, there's a, a small trend there in terms of basically every one degree uh, temperature warmer, you can get those calves, um, the, the better they, they tend to grow. Um, but we thought we could also match that actually with the data that we had from our bigger study with 60 farms, uh, because we, we again monitored the pens there quite carefully as well. So actually we've got hundreds and hundreds of animals here. And when you overlay that over the top, it's maybe not all that clear until you put on a line for every single one of those farms. You can see there's a couple of farms that buck the trend as there always will be, but almost every single farm, the line is exactly the same shape. Uh, and, and that really means that every one degree warmer you get, um, that you, you will increase your, your growth rates by about 0.014 kilos a day. So it's a reasonably small change, but we've got to remember that's for every single degree. So if you can raise it by 10 degrees, then that will be uh, 10 times more uh, growth in that, in that regard. <coughs> So we've tried to package these um, findings up into our herd health toolkit, um, as I've mentioned before. So please feel free to go and have a look at the toolkit. And um, there's a whole bunch of things you can do on there. Um, you know, you can have a look at mortality using our machine learning models um, to predict what would happen if I managed to get calves a bit warmer or picked a different month for, for calves to be born. You can look at your colostrum and just input what things you're doing at the moment on your farm. And the tool will tell you which things uh, are right to keep doing and maybe some things that maybe you need to start doing. So maybe you need to start using scalding hot water. Maybe you need to start using paracetic acid or hypochlorite to clean your collection equipment prior to feeding. You can calculate um, a whole bunch of things with the calculator, including the amount of milk replacer required to get a certain growth rates. And you can also benchmark your performance. So you can benchmark your total proteins, you can benchmark growth rates, you can benchmark disease and so on as well. And one of the biggest outcomes from the PhD was to have the, the calf health plan and that's all freely available on the uh, car, on the herd health toolkit as well. And it's really easy, there's just 20 questions, what do you do for your calf rearing currently? And then from that, it will give you this really clear traffic light system of what things you're doing well, and what things you may need to change. <coughs> It'll also give you out this report where it will benchmark you against other farms um, and, and give you some kind of key recommendations of things to things to change to improve your calf health and performance. <coughs> so some key practical points to take home. There's a few things you can do to tweak your building. So you can either alter your existing buildings, you can invest in some igloos or hutches if you don't have current space currently. <coughs> You can try polytunnels as a way of expanding to house quite a lot of calves. You can try some of these modular units, um, which are relatively expensive, but quite quite good quality and you can put anywhere on the farm. And you can also try and create some micro environments for those calves to stay warm. Colostrum we know is really important. Very important that we feed three to four liters of colostrum um, as soon as possible and definitely within six hours of birth. It's important that we test for quality of colostrum, and you can do that with a BRICS refractometer, as, as shown in the picture there, which you can also use to test calf's blood in conjunction with your vet to see, are we getting enough immunity into the calves? When we're cleaning equipment, it's really important we use scalding hot water and either hypochlorite or bleach in order to get everything that colostrum comes in contact with down to a very low level of bacteria. 
feeding and hygiene, it's really important that calves get sufficient nutrition. So colostrum as soon as possible, as we've mentioned, but also milk feeding at least six to eight litres per day. And people feeding four or five litres a day is not going to be enough for good growth, but also for good immune, immune function as well. Good targets for cleaning out rates would be about 30 days for calves and about 21 days for the calving pen. And in terms of housing, really important that calves get bedded so that you can't see their legs when they're lying down. <clears throat> and if you're in doubt with the amount of clean, dry straw to put in, put more in. Um, you, I can't emphasize enough how important clean and dry straw is in terms of keeping calves warm. We certainly want good ventilation, but we really don't want drafts. Um, and that can be quite debilitating to calf performance if they are in a in a blowing gale. So putting in some barriers at strategic points where that's just a bale of straw, you'll quite often find calves are tucked behind that bale of straw just to stay out of the wind um, and creating micro environments in, in the picture here. You can see um, a hutch inside actually with a, with a heat lamp inside as well. Um, and in the colder times, you know, you can imagine calves spend quite a lot of time in that area. And um, the temperature, we know is quite important. Um, so you could consider putting in some heat lamps. Um, they're relatively expensive to run. So obviously you'd need to share these between multiple calves for it to be worthwhile um, financially. And there is of course the fire risk as well. So please make sure if you're doing any kind of electrical heat source, then have them strapped very, very securely well out of the way of the calves. If you're going to use jackets, I probably wouldn't expect them to put too much in terms of growth rates. Um, but at least make sure they're clean and dry. Um, it is really important if they get mucky, of course, you put one calf and take your jacket from one calf and put it onto another newborn calf um, and you, you could be transmitting disease that way as well. So I hope that's been useful. Um, please go and have a look at our herd health toolkit. I hope you find that useful as well. We try to keep that as a free resource for people to use um, so you can test out some of the findings from our studies um, and also have a go with the calf health plan as well to hopefully get the best out of your calves in terms of their health, welfare and productivity. That's excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Bobby. Some um, really practical advice um, there coming out of that research. And um, of course, that uh, calf plan um, and in the herd health toolkit is also really useful. So I would encourage those of you to go away and um, have a play around with uh, the herd health toolkit and uh, the calf plan that Bobby has has mentioned. Uh, Bobby, can you? Oh, you've got the URL there on the screen, so uh, people can access it uh, directly. That's brilliant, and we'll make sure that's included in uh, the email that we sent round with uh, a link to the recording of the webinar as well. Um, so Bobby, we've got a few questions coming in here. So uh, to kick off, um, what blood protein levels should we be aiming for? Yeah, great, great question. Um, it's not an exact science, but generally people say about 7.8% um, bricks uh, is about about right. Um, the, the higher, the better, really. Um, and, and it's important as well to Remember that this isn't really an individual test. You know, it's it's not a super, super accurate test of immune level, but at a herd level it is. So you need to be testing kind of 10 or 12 animals probably to get an idea of, okay, as a herd, am I doing well in terms of colostrum management? If, you know, if you just test one and, and it's fine, that, does, that doesn't mean you're okay. You probably need to test 10 or 12. Uh, and if, if you've got two or three that aren't right, then you probably need to rethink how you're managing your colostrum. Okay, super, thanks. Um, and there's a question uh, that's come in um, about current energy costs. Of course, we're in quite a, a unique um, time at the moment with the cost of, of fuel. Um, have you by any chance looked at the economic benefit of increased growth versus uh, the energy cost of raising the local temperature? Yes, I, I have, um, and I must admit I've not you, done it you, since. I knew you would have done <laughs> <laughs> I, you, you, you know me and me and numbers, Jenny. Um, yes, but so, love them. <laughs> we, so, so yes, I, I did do those calculations when we did the, the study. Um, although, admittedly, that was a couple of years ago, and it would have been before the recent energy price increases. When I when I did it before, it was a, a bit tenuous, if I'm honest, as to whether it would be financially completely worthwhile doing. Um, so, I think if you had four calves underneath it, 
um, it would cost about 20, 25 pounds uh, to run. Of course, that might be a lot more now. Um, so if you can have them under there for the first month of life and you gain a bit of extra growth, that's that's great. Um, but is it going to be an immediate financial payback now that energy prices have gone up quite substantially from that? It's probably not, uh, is my honest answer. But I know having spoken to lots of dairy farmers about this, uh, a lot of people don't care. And they, you know, if, if it's the future of their herd and it's their replacement dairy heifers, even if it's not necessarily going to be 100 percent, yes, I'll immediately get my money back. There's a, there's a big benefit in having your calves growing faster. And um, there's a big benefit in terms of their immune function, most likely. Um, and, and there's also an element, element of, um, of welfare and comfort there as well, actually. So I think a lot of people say, OK, it's not it's maybe not going to quite pay its way. But because I want the best heifers I can possibly get, I'm willing to, to spend a bit of extra money here. Um, and, and actually, I was surprised at how many people did take it on, even if it's not an immediate. Yes, I'm going to make twice my money back immediately. Hmm. Well, I mean, I guess there's always the cost, you know, when you compare the, 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 the cost of lamps to jackets, you've got obviously the initial cost of the jackets, but you've also got the maintenance and um, the washing of them. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you have to take all that into account, I guess, don't you? No, de definitely. And and we, we all know jackets are incredibly popular. Um, you know, they're on, you know, like half the farms in the country, it seems like. Um, and again, you know, they're going to cost 20 or 30 pounds each and they, they don't last forever. Um, and, and there's zero evidence for them in terms of improving growth rates. Um, I shouldn't say zero. There is there's a reasonable bit of evidence that they don't improve growth growth rates at all. That's not to say they're, they're useless and they, they probably are comfortable for the calves, but they're not going to improve growth rates in the way uh, a heat lamp will. Okay. Um, so on the topic of calf jackets, um, one question um, is asking, am I right in thinking that whilst calf jackets have little effect on growth rates, they reduce the feed rate required to provide an economic benefit? Um, yeah, so we, we didn't find that in this study um, and other studies um, haven't, haven't found that particularly. Um, so I, I suppose anything that reduces energy expenditure might reduce feed rate. But I mean, the same you could say for for um, the heat lamps as well. They didn't seem to change their um, their performance very much. Um, most farms, I suppose, are are fed, you know, two 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 feeds um, at either end of the day and will just drink everything that's in in front of them. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm not sure I'd I'd, uh, I'd agree with that, um, that they that they'll eat less. That'd be nice if they did, but I'm not sure it's true. Okay, so moving on slightly to um, artificial uh, ventilation in terms of, of tube fans. Um, we've got a couple of questions here. Um, is there any view on whether artificial ventilation is more, in terms of tube fans, is more preferable to natural um, to avoid drafts? And then a kind of secondary question is what are your thoughts on PPTV, which I've had to get some clarification on and I'm reliably informed that it is a tube Lots fan. Of pressure. Yes, positive yeah, well, pressure positive tube pressure, ventilation. Of course, yes, That's thank right. you. <laughs> yeah, so, so, um, so yeah, so I, I suppose there it's pretty pretty much the same question, isn't it? Is um, it's just are are tubes um, with mechanical fans good for ventilation? I I think yes. We we explored it quite a lot in this study, and um, and and didn't get a great deal of um, a great deal of kind of solid science to back it up. Um, but certainly the barns that I went to with positive pressure tubes felt much much better. Um, uh, and if I if I was designing a calf house, I would I would be putting them in, um, and I would try and keep things. The, the advantages, as you kind of alluded to with the question, Jenny, um, is of course you you don't have to have those drafts. So in a, in a naturally ventilated building, you have to have kind of open sides. You have to have um, a, an outlet ventilation. With a with a positive pressure tube, you kind of flip that on its head because you're driving air into the shed and then forcing air out through all the cracks. You can actually shut things down much more and then you're forcing all of the bad bacteria and any viruses out of there but without any kind of draft and that's really crucial because you can then keep the temperature nice and warm no draft to cool calves down but you're still getting that all important ventilation if you just had a, a box and calves all lived in a, in one big box you'd have tremendous pneumonia problems so we do need that um that ventilation whilst we want to keep calves warm uh, and a tube tube fans i think are a, a very good way of achieving that Again, I suppose the, the energy question, they're not free to put in and they're not free to run, but generally they're quite cost effective um, and certainly cost of pneumonia is, is quite high. Um, so worth doing everything we can to, to prevent that. 
Okay, super. So we've talked a lot about cold weather. What about hot weather, uh, Bobby? Did you look at heat stress in the summer at all? Uh, we actually didn't run it um, over the summer months. Um, it would have been interesting to do so. Um, uh, heat stress certainly in adult cattle is, is you know, a very well researched um, and, and has a massive effect. You know, as, as we all know, even if, if it gets above about kind of 20, 25, cows start really suffering. Calves being much smaller, the very young calves probably won't suffer until it gets very, very hot. Um, although last year it did get very, very hot, and I'm sure they were they were suffering as well. Um, I suppose it's it's just much less common um, in our climate, um, so we kind of chose to focus on the, the classically high um, high disease areas. I suppose from the national data we looked at, the the very warm months, you know, in the middle of the year, the mortality rate is is as low as it can go, um, or as low as it does go, um, compared with the, the colder months, uh, which seem to be more of a problem in our climate anyway. But there's, there's lots of research in other countries in, you know, from Californian dairies and, and so on, that look into the effects of heat stress, and they and they worry much more about, about that side of things. Hmm. Um, and we've had, uh, well, at least here in Warwickshire, where I'm based, we've had very unusual uh, weather for November. I think it was a high of 18 um, in the last week, um, which is really unusual uh, for this time of year. Um, and this next question kind of alludes to that unusual um, um, weather pattern. And um, we've had we have just had two years of cold springs and warm, wet autumns. Would that influence the results of your study, do you think? I worry about wet, muggy autumns. Yeah, I, I agree. And I suppose that's uh, with, with this kind of study, you have to kind of just take whatever the, the weather throws you um, in that year. And, and one way we, we get around that in study design is by doing the randomised control trial element. So, <clears throat> yes, there would definitely be an effect of weather conditions on whether farms do well or not and whether calves do well or, or not but because we're randomly allocating all of the farms to either getting the calf health plan or not getting the calf health plan then hopefully that they have an equal chance of things being bad because of course it's it's muggy and horrible and wet and cold for everyone so um within that study we're, we're pretty confident of the findings because the the same bad conditions were there for everyone and we were able to tease apart okay if the bad conditions are there for everyone what is it about the farms that are doing well that we can pick out um, and, and kind of put in this, this plan and, and test that it works in, in this randomised control trial manner? Um, OK, and, and any comments on, on wet, muggy autumns? Any risk factors we need to consider with that type of temperature? Yeah. yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty, pretty challenging, aren't they? And, and I think, yeah, whenever you do tours around farms, as I've been doing for the last few years, um, people people hate that kind of weather and so uh, as always it's keeping clean dry straw in place it's keeping lots of ventilation um particularly in the in the in the warm muggy um kind of conditions and and things like um hutches actually are very very challenging to manage in those conditions the humidity in the hutches you can see water dripping down the the walls and um, one thing you, you can do to kind of alleviate alleviate humidity to some extent is just make sure the bedding gets cleaned out very rapid, rapidly and um, obviously wet bedding tends to produce more moisture and you want to limit that moisture as, as much as possible um, and on the topic of calf hutches um bobby um do the issues with ventilation in calf hutches outweigh the benefits what would your opinion be and um, I suppose it's like it's like all things. I, I think there there were certainly some farms that had some hutches and did very well with them, um, and there were some farms that had hutches that did extremely poorly with them. Um, so I'm I'm probably fairly ambivalent about whether people use hutches or not, but they have to be managed well. So some farms had hutches that were on bare earth floors, um, you know, right next to the muck heap, barely got cleaned out. Unsurprisingly, those calves didn't do very well. There were some other farms that had hutches on beautifully clean concrete with really good drainage in a sheltered area. Those calves did quite well. Um, so I, I think it's, it's how you manage those hutches. And, and sometimes hutches can be a little bit of an, an afterthought of, oh, we don't have any more space. So let's put some hutches in this terrible location for calves. And, you know, it, it needs to be really well thought out. And it's probably not what I'd choose if I was designing from scratch um, a calf building. Um, but they, they certainly can be effective, I think, as long as they're in a, in a sensible place and, they're, and the bedding's managed appropriately, I think they can, they can be okay. 
Yeah, I mean, I guess you don't, it's not just winter weather um, and managing hutches effectively. It's also yeah. summer weather. I know from some of our on-farm work, we put some temperature controls into hutches in the summer and, you know, inside the hutch, it, it reached an excess of 40 degrees when it's got direct sunlight in the middle of the day and then so the calf has the choice of either being in that environment or outside with no shade in direct sunlight and so it's really thinking about the placement of, of those hutches in the summer months as well isn't it Bobby anything you would add to that? No, no it's a re really good point um, point to make um, it they can be abysmal in the really really hot summer um, and if you've got that kind of setup, you you absolutely have to have some sort of shade over them. Um, it's pretty barbaric to give a, an animal a choice of 40 degrees or or the direct sunlight. Um, and yeah, we we also had um, temperature monitors in there, and they they get this enormous peak in the middle of the day in hutches that you don't see in kind of uh, other types of housing. But you, you also get this really big trough overnight as well, because of course there's no insulation, so they 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 spike to this enormous high temperature. And in the colder months at night time they fall to this incredibly low temperature as well which can be can be pretty bad too um so yeah i think having having some sort of shelter over the over the hutches can work quite nicely um, kind of gives you a little bit of best of both worlds of, of yes okay they've got quite a lot of ventilation in the hutches but they don't have direct rain wind sun those kind of things uh, directly onto the hutches and a, a lot of the um research papers that I mentioned relating to hutches in other countries um, revolve around what can we do to stop them getting so hot. So can we put um, foil over them, for example, to try and reflect that heat back so you don't get that spike of 40 degrees, um, you know, things like that. And ha haven't been enormously successful as far as I can remember um, from those studies. Um, I think they are, you, you just need to have some something over them to protect them from that heat. Yeah, super. Um... Uh, was there any issues with mixing of ages in calf groups? Um, I always wonder if smaller all year round herds may have greater pressures on things like coxie. Yes, um, I, would, I would agree with that. I think that's a good point. Um, yes, there was some some bits that came out of the study suggesting that keeping the same groups was, was quite important. So the, the highest maximum age that you had in your first group was associated with better growth rates. So in other words, that means the longer you can leave them in that first group, the better they tend to do. And we know they're social animals, they have quite a hierarchy. So if you are chopping and changing groups, it puts them off their feed. They have, you know, have to fight their way back into that pecking order again um, to, to kind of find their find their level in that group. So yeah, and, and there's also a disease risk, of course, as well as, as with anything, if, you, if you're mixing groups of animals, if, you know, much as you mix groups of people, they, you know, everyone tends to get coughs and colds if you suddenly start mixing. So keeping them in one group um, preserves their social structure. It means they probably grow better and it means they're probably less likely to, to mix. But it's it's very hard for kind of the seasonal herd, especially if you have managed to get a nice tight block carving herd, um, you, you've got no calves at all, no calves at all, and then suddenly you've, you've got this enormous number of calves to deal with. So some of the, the other building options that I, I mentioned there, like putting a, a poly tunnel up, for example, um, or something like that, can, can buy you a bit of short-term temporary space that can be quite effective um, and kind of alleviate some of that stocking rate pressure that you might otherwise have. <laughs> Thanks, um, Bobby. Now, I can't actually remember if you looked at um, the type of milk powder that was being fed to calves, but this next question is wondering whether your study could shed any light on whether skim or whey-based powder is better for calf health. Yeah, so it's a really good question. I spent a huge amount of time um, exploring the, the different uh, levels of milk. So not just what type it was and not just whether it was skim or whey, but actually went right the way down to, you know, what level of crude protein, any additives they had. You know, we put all these things into the models um, and it, it's not to say there's there's no effect to, to any of that. It was a much lower effect than some of the, the bigger uh, things that, that I talked about in the presentation. Uh, I think that ultimately, you know, calves have evolved to drink milk from their mother several times a day, probably 10 or 12 litres a day if they, if you, you know, if you're a beef suckler cow. And that's really what we should be, <coughs> what we should be going for. Um, so, so the closer we can get to ad lib liquid milk whenever they want, as much as they want, um, the, the better. Um, so, so from that point of view, the, the higher quality powders tend to have more, uh, more milk proteins in, like, such as whey, um, and the, the cheaper, lower quality powders tend to have some plant proteins in, 
um, to kind of bulk them out a bit. And of course, they're much, much less digestible for the calf as well. So trying to emulate what a what a beef suckler cow um, would be providing is kind of the goal and, and getting just getting as close to that as you possibly can within your management system um, is, is really the goal I think we should all be striving for. Super. So in terms of keeping uh, calves in pairs or groups, um, was there any observations on navel sucking? Yeah, there is certainly something that a lot of people um, mentioned to me um, and, and I know a lot of people uh, complain about now. Now they, they kind of have to put pairs or groups um, for a lot of a lot of supermarket con contracts nowadays. Um, people still complain uh, about navel sucking it is quite challenging um, in some some farms. Um, I think one one thing I've noticed is people definitely can do pair housing and group housing and don't get navel sucking issues. So it, it is possible. Um, and certainly people talk about disease risk as well. Again, there's lots of farms that do really well with pairs and with groups and don't have big disease outbreaks. So a few things people have said, you know, with regards to navel sucking and, and competition over feed and so on is putting a divider in for parts of the day. So when you're feeding, you can put a divider between two calves in a pair housing, for example, to stop them kind of battling over the same the same teat. Um, and providing them other types of stimulation, other things to play with as well, um, you know, things from to direct that natural sucking behaviour into other areas other than their their pen mates uh, navel um, can help alleviate that as well. So it is a kind of a natural behaviour, isn't it, to try and suckle on things and it's just misdirected to their to their pen mate. Um, but it but it definitely can work, and there's lots of farms where it, it works very well doing pair housing, group housing. Um, yeah, it, it is becoming more common, I think, um, Bobby, to see in, enrichment, if that's the right mm. word, or, or toys in the calf mm. pen for, for calves to, to play with. Actually, on our GB Calf Week uh, webinar yesterday, the little video that was showed had lots of boys hanging from the ceiling for the calves yeah. to play with. Um, so it always warms my heart when I see things like that in calf in calf pens. No, um, definitely, and, it, and it's the, the I, I completely agree, and and the you know the idea of welfare we, we usually kind of think of as you know good welfare is just they're not in pain they're not hungry they've not got disease but but actually you know I, I might not be in pain and disease but it doesn't necessarily mean I'm happy um, and actually you know having toys and things and to play with and exhibit those natural behaviors and um, so they're you know they're really as happy as they could be that positive welfare uh, I think is a, a really interesting area that we're, we're doing quite a lot of research on at the moment but how can we achieve that on farms is is quite an interesting question to get them as happy as they can, as well as having no disease and, and not being discomfort as well. I wonder if any of our listeners have had any experience of putting toys in mm. the calf pens that they'd like to share in the question box. Uh, please do. Uh, and I'll move on to the next uh, question, which is, did you look at calving ease as a factor of survivability? Um, calving ease, uh, I suppose that would mean um, in terms of the um, the bull um, and, yeah, and so on. Is that, yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so no, we and we didn't we didn't have that information. That would be pretty challenging to get that information. I think for every single one of the calves on the farm, mm -hmm. um, we we did we did kind of a proxy for that. I suppose in that for every calf born, we we had a um, you know was it a difficult calving or not. So I suppose we had a bit of a proxy there. That that didn't come back as being important, um, or as as important as the other things in the study. Um, but we 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 know it is um, important to some degree. And of course, if if you've got a bad calving, it's bad for the cow, but it's also probably bad for the calf because they're gonna you know they're under a fair bit of pressure. They're probably gonna be quite bruised afterwards and might not suck quite as quickly. Might not get as much colostrum as they should do, and so on. So I, I think it's it's probably important. I mean, it's probably most important for farmers and vets sanity as much as anything you know no one likes hard carvings um you know it's not it's not good for anyone it takes up a lot of time and it, it's probably not worth it there's plenty of good um good bulls out there now that that have you know easy carving but also have good growth rates and um i think it's probably worth prioritizing that yeah, and, and, and talking about that, the more that we can get the sire um, registered when we register the calf on BCMS, the more information yeah. we'll have for evaluations exactly. and the more easy it will be for people like Bob, Bobby to be able to access that information if they need it for large studies like this. So um, just a bit of a plug for um, our shout about the sire campaign, which is all about encouraging you to, to record the sire uh, 
BCMS registration, please. Um, so the questions are, are still coming in. Um, one on BVD status. Um, was your BVD status known um, on the farms in the study? Yeah, um, unfortunately, it wasn't known for the individual calf, um, but it, it, for the same reasons as the as the sire, I suppose it's just you know you, you want to have every bit of detail you can for every study, of course, but to get that information would would be quite a lot of effort um, for the farmer. Um, so we decided not to do, go that route, but we did know the BVD status of the herd. We know the vaccination status of the herd. We know um, when they last had any um, uh, any any PIs or anything like that. So so we knew quite a lot at herd level, and that didn't seem to have too much impact um, for the study, but I would say most of the farms actually were were negative in the study. So it might just be that we didn't have we didn't have high BVD herds, and you know, the, and I think the, the research on BVD is, is very clear. If you've got BVD um, calves, PI calves, persistently infected calves in the group of calves, all of the other calves are much more likely to get disease. So controlling BVD is is a no-brainer for me. It's it's very very cheap to do really compared with most diseases. Um, you know, discuss with your vet how you, how you do that. It's pretty cheap. It's pretty easy, really, compared with a lot of diseases. Get BVD off your off your farm um, if you've got it. It will be it will be a very bad thing for your calf health and performance. And you had um, sixty farms on the study, Bobby. That's quite a lot, really. Um, how did you go about selecting those farms? Yeah, um, so <clears throat> we wanted them to be across the whole country, so we went to um, a, a large supermarket group, um, and we we sent out um letters to to a large portion of those farmers and then recruited them then so uh, it, it's not a, a perfect study in that they were all part of a supermarket group and supermarket groups generally a um a reasonably good standard of, of health and welfare as it as it is but we certainly found a quite a large variation uh within those farms um so you know obviously it would be nice to have a random selection across all supermarket groups but this was kind of the, the easiest and fastest way to get a large number of farms that that would kind of you know be take part in the in the research project okay so i think we've just got a couple of minutes left and um so probably time for one more question um bobby um sorry i feel like i've just been throwing them at you for the last That's half right. an hour <laughs> but it's great that there's so many questions um were there any differences in policy on feeding transition milk? So this is post colostrum. Um, what would be the recommended number of days to feed this milk for calf viability? Uh, yeah, it's, good. it's a good question. I'm not sure I've probably got an exact answer in terms of this is the specific number of days. Um, people are fairly varied in it. Um, I would say, you know, but, but certainly a few days worth afterwards. Again, we're just trying to emulate what would a beef suckler calf with its with its mum do and of course it would get colostrum straight away and then it would be on transition milk for the next i don't know up to a, up to a week maybe there might be an element of um colostrum immunity within that within that milk so yeah i, I think doing certainly for a few days would be would be a, a good thing um depending on the disease risk of your of your herd if you, you've got a herd with a lot of tb and with a lot of yonis that kind of thing then actually probably you've got to weigh up that risk of okay it's probably a good thing for the calf but maybe if you're feeding uh, transition milk that's likely got a lot of yonis in it maybe that's going to be a bad thing for you later on so I suppose it's weighing up the ris risks for each individual herd um, Okay, great. Well, I'm going to stop there with the questioning because um, that's quite been quite a bombardment on you, uh, Bobby. You've done really well to tackle them all. Right, I'll go um, for a quiet lie down now. <laughs> thanks very much. Um, so thanks to everyone that tuned in um, this afternoon. I hope you've all taken um, some nice um, clear messages away from Bobby's presentation. Uh, please feel, fair, feel free to share um, what you've learned um, on social media and don't forget to use the hashtag at GBCalfWeek. We still have a whole host of activities and events. When I say we, I mean we as in the collective industry because GB Calf Week is all about um, promoting a GB Calf strategy whose vision is about rearing all calves with care and eliminating the euthanasia of calves by 2023. And that's a vision that's owned by industry that AHDB and NFU just facilitate. Um, so please um, have a look at the program um, and uh, join any more events, webinars. There's a couple of on-farm events coming up um, over the next week. 
Um, and thank you very much to Bobby and to Steve, who's behind the scenes running all of the uh, the controls and keeping me right on the questions. Uh, thank you, Steve. And thank you everyone for tuning in. Goodbye.